ただいまより。We would now like to begin the Innovative City Forum Urban Strategy Session. Structural changes in world cities. What constitutes a fascinating city in the post COVID 19 era? A message from the Secretariat to the audience. On the right hand of the screen, you will find Slido, which is a chat tool. Please send us your Questions and comments using the Slido function. Now, without further ado, let me welcome the panelists in the Urban Strategy session. From London, New York, and Singapore, we have multiple panelists who are connecting online. From London, Director of Center for London, Mr. Ben Rogers. And from New York, Executive Director of the Center for an Urban Future, Mr. Jonathan Bowles. From Tokyo, Japan, Professor of Chiba University, Miki Muraki. And from Singapore, Director of Research Center for Livable Cities, Dr. Lee Min Hee. And the moderator for this session is the Executive Director of the Mori Memorial Foundation, Mr. Hiro Ichikawa. So today we would like to talk about the structural changes in rural cities and what constitutes a fascinating city in the post-COVID-19 era, connecting to London, New York, Singapore, and Tokyo. We would like to hear uh, views from four experts from London very early in the morning, from New York very late in the evening. Thank you very much uh, for participating. So I would like to begin by talking about uh, what is happening in Tokyo and the world. And then uh, from the four cities, uh, there will be a presentation. And then we'll have a panel discussion at the end. So let me kick off uh, from uh, my presentation. This is the rough time allocation, about seven minute presentation each. Uh, but uh, we will have uh, uh, some time for uh, the panel discussion. In our session, we talked about future living, future work, future mobility, and future entertainment. These four functions of the city. Uh, so I will be speaking uh, based on these four perspectives. So the most epoch-making phenomenon uh, that we saw this year is COVID-19. Uh, so a uh, state of emergency was announced and uh, urban activities were suspended. And we will look at the world. There is a rise in COVID-19 cases. This graph shows the cumulative number of positive cases. And the U.S. is by far the largest, but uh, the number is growing all over the world. And uh, the number is growing even further uh, as we uh, are in November. This is taking the weekly confirmed cases. So. Uh, there was uh, the first wave, second wave, and now we are in the midst of the third wave. So globally, there is a rise in COVID-19 cases. So this ICF was held uh, against this backdrop. And the same applies to Japan. Uh, the cases are growing. This is a cumulative number. And this is uh, November 11th. So now 
uh, the number is uh, much larger. So we are really in the third wave, indeed. So the first wave, the government announced a state of emergency. So there was a, a countrywide effort to contain COVID. But uh, the second wave, third wave, there is no longer such a nationwide state of emergency. But we still have to uh, try to contain the cases. So we don't know what will happen, but there is no doubt the number of cases is increasing. And this is Tokyo, 2 p.m. on a weekday. The left-hand side shows October of last year. The middle uh, shows April to May uh, under the state of emergency uh, this year. And the latest data on the right shows October of 2020. So compared to uh, the previous October, uh, the people's movement is less. So well, how would the pandemic affect the future? So COVID-19 related questionnaires were sent to these uh, cities, London, Paris, Singapore, San Francisco, and New York, uh, with 1,000 respondents per city. So the first question, to what extent has COVID-19 influenced lifestyle from uh, not at all to extremely impacted? So if you compare the cities, moderate to extreme is relatively the same if you combine these two uh, across the cities. About 70% feel that they were moderately or extremely impacted. So the next question, how did policies of workable places change? This may be a bit difficult to see, but London and Tokyo is perhaps clear. The red says working here is not allowed. In London, if you compare pre-COVID and current status, now, So uh, 26 percent for London. So uh, what we can see is that in London, more people are restricted from going to office uh, than in Tokyo. And the uh, same goes for New York and Singapore. Sorry, this was the one that I wanted to show. The, the previous one was a bit different, I'm sorry. Uh, the last one was working from home, but this one is uh, about the office. This is very uh, symbolic. For London, uh, many people are prohibited from going to the office. And Singapore is, to a less, lesser extent, similar to London, but in Tokyo, uh, most companies do not prohibit people from going to office. So more people are going to the office in Tokyo. And uh, where people work. So more people are working from home under COVID, but uh, whether uh, people are going to uh, working from home or from the office. And this is before COVID, now and future. If you look at New York, before COVID, 23% worked from home. Now it's 41%. But in the future, uh, it's very similar to now. But this is different if you look at Tokyo. New York, San Francisco, London are, are similar, but uh, Tokyo is quite different. So we uh, call the post-COVID world after COVID. Where people are working after COVID, many people are thinking that working from home will increase uh, more than today. And commuting, 
uh, especially if for Japan, people are traveling uh, via trains on packed trains. And uh, such mass transportation uh, may have higher risk of COVID infection. But if you look at the results, the increase in personal transport like car or foot uh, was not that large. Uh, there was not a major shift in the way of people commute. Uh, there were uh, some people who refrained from using trains and went by uh, bicycles or on foot, uh, but that portion was not large. So this is actually an important theme. We thought that uh, pe more people will be traveling via bicycles, but this did not happen. Uh, actually, uh, perhaps this data uh, is difficult to extract because more less people are actually commuting and more people are working from home. And uh, there has been about a 30% decrease in the use of trains. But what will happen in the, fa in the future? Uh, we do not see a mass shift to uh, people who walk or people who use bicycles. Uh, there may be some, but not large. And another question we asked was people are not able to go to work due to pandemic and people are staying at home. So we asked whether uh, you are able to engage in leisure activities. Tokyo and Singapore, London, New York. Tokyo and New York, more than half of the respondents said that the time spent on leisure increased. On the other hand, this ratio is less for Singapore and London. London, uh, only half, only one third. So perhaps the word leisure uh, was defined differently uh, by the respondents. So uh, leisure activities, meaning uh, whether uh, you are able to spend time on leisure activities at home or whether you need to uh, go out uh, in order to enjoy leisure activities. But this is really not a uh, uh, difference from uh, language because London and New York, uh, both in English, uh, responded differently. But I think that this will also have some bearing on uh, how we view the future and also where people spend their free time. So when people have some time to kill, where do they spend that time? Whether uh, in home or out of home. Uh, before COVID, with uh, in Tokyo, London, New York, Singapore, about 70% said outside. But of course now oh, this is smaller or less than half or one third. But going forward in the future, of course, more people will be spending time outside of home. But this ratio will not be as high as pre-COVID. So people have learned from this experience and people are concerned that they will not be able to uh, spend time outside as much as before. And then who you spend that time with. Uh, so in the past, you spend more time with uh, everybody, but now oh, people are spending more time with their family, with members of their household. And this will apply in the future in most cities. Uh, but this is also different. Singapore and Tokyo are similar, but London and New York different. So uh, perhaps there uh, are difference between uh, culture or, or between nations and uh, how people want to spend their time differs. So this is toward the end of my presentation. But what we were most interested was in uh, whether people want to move their residence due to the pandemic. And when people are congested together, there is a like, higher likelihood of uh, catching the uh, COVID. So we were uh, wondering whether more people want to move out of cities. And about 70% uh, for Tokyo, uh, lowest was 
New York, and then so 70% said it is possible uh, to change residence. Sorry, sorry, no, wait. I let me correct. Sorry, if 70% of people in Tokyo said no, there is no possibility uh, that uh, they are going to change their residence. And this ratio was lower for uh, New York. So most people uh, uh, in these cities do not think that they are going to change their residence. On the other hand, uh, nearly 40% or 50% for uh, New York uh, are thinking of changing their residence. So after the pandemic, this is a very important theme. Where people live? So 70% of people in Tokyo want to stay in Tokyo, but uh, uh, for New York, 50%. So uh, the rest of the people uh, could be changing their uh, locations. So for 20%, perhaps for Tokyo, they may change their residence. And New York, perhaps 40%. And this perhaps is a reflection of the high home ownership rate of Tokyo uh, rather than renting. So, but 60-40, uh, or, or that may be the ratio of people who are looking to relocate. And if they are going to relocate, where they want to move to? This is the second question in line uh, with that initial first question. Do they want to live closer to the city center or more in the suburban areas? This is very interesting, but Singapore, New York, uh, more people answer they want to get closer to the city center. And then for Tokyo and London, more people want to move to the suburbs. So there is a difference in the tendency. And Tokyo has a high concentration of the population. So we are wondering whether uh, people want to move out and uh, relocate to regional cities, but whether people really are going to relocate outside Tokyo, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, we have to wait until the COVID uh, situation is over uh, to see what really happens. So I have reported on the views of the people from these uh, different cities. So from now, I would like to uh, ask uh, the speakers to share uh, their views. Thank you very much. Now, let me turn to the first presenter, uh, Director uh, Ben Rogers. So we agreed on using our first name. So let's start from Ben. Uh, please share your experience from London. Good, af well, good, good afternoon for you. Uh, good, good morning for me. Um, right, can you? Oh, why is it doing that? Hang on a second. Sorry, can you, can you see my full screen now? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, okay, just a just, uh, just, uh, river uh, ship. Uh, <laughs> up and okay, down, ship. Uh, it's up okay. Down. okay hi. But, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Just, well, give me one second. Let, let's, let, let's do the full screen. There we are. Right. Um, right. That's, I'm, I'm Ben Rogers, and I'm the director of Centre for London. And for those of you that don't know us, we are uh, London's think tank. And we do research, we hold events. Um, and we try and influence for, for a better city. And I'm just going to talk, I've just got 10 slides, and I'm going to talk about um, how uh, the pandemic has affected London. So uh, we, we had, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, hit London, it's hit the UK hard, um, and particularly in the, in the early days, uh, we were one of the most severely hit uh, countries uh, in the EU. We are now more or less in line with some of the other um, la larger countries in terms of just the sort of rate um, of excess deaths, which is represented in, in this slide. Um, London was hit uh, first of all the UK regions. Um, and I must admit, I remember writing very sort of gloomy uh, articles um, back in, in March and April, where we assumed that London as a sort of biggest city with the highest densities in the UK would be hit um, particularly hard. In fact, uh, as this graph shows, London is represented in black. 
um, other regions, particularly in the north of um, of England, have had higher rates of 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 COVID. And London is now is one of the sort of the the areas which has got the lowest rates of of COVID. Really, quite surprising. Um, not quite sure why this is. Uh, Londoners have been this, this. This looks at where people are, are working uh, across global cities, so London, Madrid, Seoul, and so on. Uh, and you can see that um, London has got well right now pretty much the one of the lowest rates of people travelling to work. So most people in London are are working from home, and, and that's much more so the case in London than it is say in in in, in Seoul or. Um, uh, Stock, Stockholm, for instance. And despite the fact that actually London has not been as badly hit by COVID in terms of the sort of just the, 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 the prevalence of the disease, um, its economy has taken um, a real hit. Uh, so this is um, changes in, uh, in, this is about job losses. And you can see that this is, so this is people claiming unemployment benefit, and you can see that London um, uh, has got a higher rate of higher increase in the number of people uh, claiming um, jobless benefits. And this is probably just because of the prevalence of industries which depend on face-to-face -face contact and which have therefore been um, very negatively affected by lockdown. Uh, so both the hospitality sector, which is huge in London, um, and the creative industries, the performance industries, and, and those two things ac account for a much larger proportion of London's economy than, than the economy of the UK as a whole. I should say we've had two lockdown periods in, in the UK. So the first was from uh, basically the end of March until June, uh, and then a second one, which is last year, the, 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 the last month and ends next week. Uh, as you as you might expect, um, some people. So this is a survey we did asking people whether they were better off or worse off as a result of the pandemic, um, particularly with regard to their income. Some uh, a significant proportion um, of Londoners are better off. So about seventeen percent is that uh, say that they're that they're better off. That's more than across the UK as a whole. I think those are people who have been able to work from home, make savings on on travel costs. Uh, perhaps make savings on childcare costs, um, but a, a much more significant number say that they are they are worse off. So in London, about um, forty five percent of Londoners are worse off um, in terms of income as a result of the pandemic. And this this varies very significantly across different groups. So if we look at the age groups, uh, sixty five year olds plus, so people who are retired from work have not seen. Um, uh, a, a big decline in their disposable income because, of course, their income is is, is largely in the forms of pensions. Um, the age groups which have been hit hardest are those at sort of prime working age, 25 to uh, 44. And then a big um, divergence in ethnicity. So black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, Londoners are significantly more likely to say that they are worse off as a result of the pandemic. And they're also much more likely to have fallen ill and have died, unfortunately, than white Londoners. Um, we've seen a, a really profound <laughs> collapse in public transport use um, in London, as you'd expect, and as we've already seen, uh, Londoners are much less likely to be going to work than almost any other major global city. Um, and we've had uh, falls of sometimes up to 90% in um, use of the tube in particular. This um, not, has not just hit central London's economy very hard, it's hit the um, finances of Transport for London that, uh, very hard as well. Uh, Transport for London relies to a very unusual extent on fare income. It gets very little income from uh, other sources other than fares. And so a collapse in fare income has been disastrous for its finances. And the city has had to go twice now to seek um, bailouts from national government who have given um, support but very grudgingly and with lots of conditions. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is just um, uh, 
a chart looking at, uh, at where people are spending their time over over since just before lockdown or the pandemic hit until um, until the present. And what we see um, is if you look at the orange line, so that's workplaces, a big fall in people spending time in, in their workplace, not surprisingly. Uh, perhaps more surprisingly is the green one, parks. So we saw over the summer in particular, a really big increase in the amount of time people were spending in London's parks. And we've seen a sort of real, I think, re-appreciation of, of, of or a real yeah, growth in, in appreciation of the role that parks and local neighbourhood amenities and, and public realm can play in our lives. So central London has been uh, hit most negatively by, um, by the pandemic. And we really can talk about a sort of crisis, an economic crisis for, for central London. Uh, this isn't really surprising if you think that um, uh, how much London has depended on the visitor economy, on overseas uh, tourists and national tourists, and how much it depends on, on commuters. Uh, once you take those two things away, um, there's not much of the central London's economy left. And as a city, it's always depended also very, very strongly on, on public transport to get people in and out of central London. So people don't drive into central London. So you can see that we remain very nervous about traveling into central London. And you can see uh, on the my, my right, so the, the map shows um, how much more profoundly hit the central London boroughs are than the rest of London. And my last slide, we did a survey just asking people whether they were um, likely to leave London in the next year. Uh, slightly to our surprise, um, only 7% said they were, sorry, what, what, um, only 7% said that they, they were unlikely to be in London in a year's time, which is pretty much the rate previously. So it does suggest actually that, that the pandemic isn't having a sort of big impact on Londoners' plans to stay in or leave the city. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Compared to our questionnaire, we were able to understand uh, the situation in London more in more detail. How to uh, um, uh, lessen the uh, impact of uh, negative impact on the economy? How should we live going forward? We're facing a major challenge. So next, the presentation will be from Jonathan from New York. Jonathan, please take the floor. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Okay, bear with me one second, please. Can you see it now? Uh, it, not yet. <laughs> it doesn't come yet. Okay. Apologize for this. Uh, not yet. Uh, we were able to see the rehearsal. We were able to see... Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, I apologize for that. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bowles and I uh, run the Center for an Urban Future, which is a think tank here in New York City. Uh, it's very late in New York right now, but I'm so pleased to be here and talking about how COVID is really transforming New York. And I think, um, you know, New York has gone through a number of severe challenges over the past two decades, 9-11 uh, uh, and the terrorist attacks. Uh, we had a financial crisis that hit New York hard, but I think uh, the COVID crisis is really taking things to a whole nother level. Right. To move my screen.
All right. Apologies for the technical difficulties. But as you can see, New York was really the public face of, uh, of COVID, I think, globally for a period in April. Um, we saw, um, you know, the face of tragedy. Uh, at one point, there were more than 8,000 new COVID cases in a single day in New York in April. Um, as you see from this next slide, um, it, it, it shows the cases by borough, and New York City has five boroughs. I think what's interesting about this is that uh, the borough of Staten Island had the most cases in the beginning and has really kind of maintained that, including to the present day. And it's, what's interesting about that is that Staten Island is the least dense part of New York. And I think it really kind of punctures the, the perception that COVID is uh, a disease that's hitting a dense city the hardest. Um, and I wanna go back um, and, and talk about the, um, you know, the, the arc of this disease in New York because we did see an extraordinary number of deaths in April and early May in New York. Uh, we saw so many cases, but the city since then has really bounced back. And through from from June, from June and through the um, from June until till the present, uh, COVID cases have really remained low, and I think that's really uh, helped New York because uh, for so long it was really the poster child of what was wrong in a response to COVID. And I think New York has really come back uh, fairly strong since then. I want to talk a little bit about some of the policies that New York has implemented to, um, to try to get this um, 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 uh, uh, in order. And, and, you know, New York was, was slow, but it, it shut down non-essential businesses uh, and issued strict social distancing rules. Uh, it issued a mask mandate earlier than most places in the United States. Uh, and those were extremely successful in reversing the spike in cases of COVID. It helped, helped reduce community spread. Uh, and also uh, New York was, was, I think, very smart in having a phased reopening by region across the state of New York uh, so that uh, cities and regions had to meet a certain threshold of caseloads uh, of safety levels uh, before they were allowed to open, and they were allowed to open only uh, a bit at a time. So there were some missteps in New York. Um, I think, first of all, the stay-at-home order in New York came almost a week after San Francisco did the same thing. And that delay allowed massive community spread and cost thousands of lives. Uh, the state of New York ordered nursing homes to accept COVID patients from hospitals. I think this turned out to be a mistake we've seen in New York, uh, as with other places, but I think more severely here, uh, the number of deaths in nursing homes was staggering. Um, there was an order in the first couple of weeks uh, for hospitals to increase capacity by 50%. Uh, this made sense for a number of reasons, but also led to some healthcare mistakes that accelerated deaths of the virus. I think there's some other policies that go beyond um, healthcare uh, measures that have been really interesting and are worth sharing. Uh, New York City's Economic Development Agency coordinated with local manufacturing companies to make masks and gowns, testing kits and ventilators. They really added some crucial capacity during a period where the hospitals were overwhelmed. The federal government in the United States was not producing or taking steps to help New York get those uh, crucial pieces of equipment. Uh, there were also some other regulations relaxed around telehealth services you know, at a time when a lot of people wanted medical care but didn't want to necessarily go into a doctor's office or a hospital, this was a crucial step that was taken. Uh, the state and the city also issued a moratorium on evictions to make sure that vulnerable people who had lost income uh, were not kicked out onto the street. 
Uh, New York also expanded unemployment insurance to cover independent workers. And we all know that we've seen such a huge increase in people working in the gig economy and independent work these days. There were other policies that were in, implemented as well. And, um, you know, one of the most, uh, I think, exciting things about New York is that the city launched open streets and outdoor dining. Um, I think this has helped restaurants survive. It's revived street life around the city and it's boosted the city's vibrancy. Also this year, the city legalized e-scooters and e-bikes. Uh, it supported the surging demand for micro-mobility options in New York. And it accelerated a plan to provide affordable broadband for low-income residents. I think we've all seen that the digital divide uh, is a, such an important and, and growing challenge for cities uh, to meet the demand as so many uh, New Yorkers are going to school and work virtually these days. So what else have we seen that's changed? What are the changes in work style and lifestyle? I think one of the things that's similar to London, people have gotten outside. Ben talked about how people were going to parks you know, in New York, I think people have gotten outside and, and dined out at restaurants more than ever. Uh, uh, as you see here from this image, uh, you know, this is a street not in Manhattan, but, uh, but in one of the boroughs outside and just on a regular street with a lot of car traffic, uh, the city made it very easy for restaurants to open up outdoor dining uh, within streets where parking uh, spots used to be. Uh, this didn't happen before in New York. New York has closed dozens of streets um, from car traffic to pedestrian. Um, this has, I think, been one of the real uh, important uh, adjustments for New York. Uh, with so many people cooped up in their apartments and homes, New Yorkers have gotten outside in huge numbers. This is a street in Chinatown. Uh, New Yorkers have also, just like London, flocked to parks and open spaces. And like in London, subway ridership has fallen significantly. Uh, even today, uh, subway ridership is only about 30% of what it was pre-pandemic. Uh, so this is a huge change in commuting patterns. We have seen bike usage in New York uh, grow pretty significantly. Uh, a lot of it is for leisure. Uh, people are riding around their neighborhoods in, in new levels. Uh, but when they are going to work, we're seeing a lot of people scared to take the subway. They are using a bike uh, to get to work, and the city has expanded bike lanes uh, to, to make that accommodating. You know, uh, your survey, I think, mentioned that New York was one of the cities where we, we might see people moving out. And in fact, uh, the, the numbers of uh, open, vacant rental apartments in Manhattan suggest that then that is probably happening. Um, I'm not sure that there's a massive exodus, but this alone shows that in September of 2020, there were about 16,000 vacant apartments in Manhattan. At the same time last year, there was a third as many. So far, only about 10% of Manhattan's office workers have come back to their desks. Now, this doesn't include all jobs, uh, a lot of services workers have gone back to their to their work, but people working in Manhattan offices, uh, only about 10% have gone back to work so far. And I'll, let, I'll end with this slide. I think one of the things that, like in London, that concerns us the most is, um, is unemployment and the economy. Uh, we've seen that going into this uh, COVID crisis, New York City was on par with the national average in the United States with unemployment, 3.6% for the nation and 3.7% in New York City. But today, the unemployment rate in New York is almost double the rate for the United States. Uh, New York has a disproportionate share of the industries that have been hit the hardest, uh, hotels, hospitality, restaurants, um, nail salons, childcare services, a lot of the other services work uh, that has been hit the hardest in this. Uh, I will go on a little bit more about this in a bit, but um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.
similar to London. The COVID is very difficult because we also have to uh, deal with the trade-off uh, between uh, sustaining the pandemic and the economic impact. So thank you very much. And next, let me turn to uh, Professor Muraki or Miki. Do you see the screen? Yes. So the title of my presentation, New Life in Tokyo After COVID-19. I am Muraki from Chiba University. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. So this is Tokyo under the state of emergency. Left hand side shows Shibuya, uh, the uh, very large crosswalk. As you can see, this place is always, always packed with people. But during this period, we saw uh, the people disappear from the city. And we are uh, faced with a sense of uncertainty. How long do we have to bear this? How long do we have to continue to wear masks? And there were uh, some face, fake news uh, that uh, toilet paper is going to run out and uh, people rushed to purchase uh, these everyday goods and so we saw shelves empty uh, and uh, these daily goods disappearing uh, was a sense of great fear in Tokyo. And now that we are looking at the post-COVID world, when the first hearing was held uh, on the discussion of urban policy for digitalization and new normal uh, after COVID. So there were uh, several uh, committee meetings held on the government level. One was how to uh, change our lifestyle in the new normal and how do we utilize urban assets and facilities how will urban services change? Also, uh, data is seen to be very important, but how do we obtain the data and how do we utilize that data? And who will be uh, supporting the city building and the planning process? These were the topics that were discussed in the government committee. And I would like to uh, talk about the topics that really concern me, but one is where we work and how we work. There has been a higher tendency of people spending more time in the area surrounding their homes. So oh, as you can see, uh, around the house is plus. On the other hand, city center away from home, that's negatively impacted. So the scope of people's movements became very uh, much smaller uh, around their homes. This was one impact of COVID. And as was seen in the previous presentation by Mr. Ichikawa, uh, in Japan, teleworking was not that popular, but now oh, it has become quite prevalent. And many people oh, no longer want to ride on the overcrowded trains. Also, oh, many people notice that they don't necessarily have to go to work every day. Having said that, there is a very large impact on public transportation like uh, rail, bus, and air airport, air airplanes, uh, air travel. I am currently in Sapporo, uh, although my background uh, of uh, is uh, Tokyo, uh, but uh, there was a great impact on air travel as well. At the same time, we also found that uh, discussions uh, at the office is important. So going forward, office will still be necessary if we're having such face-to-face -face discussion. Now, there were also uh, new needs that were dis discovered to have uh, small offices in the suburbs. Uh, Japanese houses always have children's rooms, kids' rooms, but there is no dad's room or study for the dad. So uh, during the teleworking, there was a problem for finding workspace in the home especially people who purchase the suburbs, uh, a home in their suburbs, 
securing a, an office space uh, for the father became a big challenge. So if you cannot find space in your home, perhaps you need a, a small office in the suburbs uh, outside of the home. And this may be a, a rising needs uh, in the post-COVID world. Also, uh, the way we approach work changed. This is Karuizawa uh, workation facility. It's about one hour via the bullet train from Tokyo. You can live uh, with a lot of greens around you and uh, you can still work in this uh, workation facility. Also, there are people who are moving out of Tokyo and relocating to uh, a more regional city. These are trends that were created because of COVID. Also, Japan has a lot of natural disasters, so you need a plan for evacuation. This is uh, the massive blackout that we had two years ago in Hokkaido, Iburi. And at that time, because of the blackout, over 1,000 people lined up to charge their cell phones. So if this happens uh, under COVID, or if this happens in Tokyo, um, it's very scary. And there are some things that were possible in Tokyo, but that were not done in the world, but not in Tokyo. For example, uh, New York uh, speaker talked about an open cafe, outdoor cafe, uh, but uh, this is not easily done in Japan. However, uh, the government uh, decided to exempt the uh, street use fee uh, until March. Uh, perhaps going forward, uh, we will be uh, utilizing uh, smart technologies, digital tools to enable online booking and payment uh, and being able to enjoy a dining outside. Also, there are other ways to promote digital or utilization. For example, using data uh, to understand the people's flows and being able to work outside uh, with Wi-Fi access outdoors. So perhaps a new way of working will arise in Japan uh, because of COVID. And at that time, I think a multifaceted QOL uh, should be evaluated. And this is my last slide. In the post-COVID world, how do we look at uh, QOL, quality of life? This shows the Otemachi Marunouchi Yurakucho area in front of the Tokyo station. And there was a SDG project and the results are shown. So perhaps there could be a new way to evaluate the value of a city uh, from a different perspective. So we have to think about what are the new values. And of course, we have to uh, consider sustainability. Uh, and that is something that should be uh, assessed. And the uh, value uh, or the contribution to sustainability in line with the uh, ESG it uh, could be uh, measured. And that could be a multi-asseted, faceted way to evaluate the value of cities going forward. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in London, there was uh, two lockdowns. But in the case of uh, Japan, uh, lockdowns are very difficult to implement. Uh, and the emergency declaration was made on one occasion to limit uh, the movement of people. But uh, uh, within this constraint, uh, there was uh, uh, a free movement, and uh, it was not just the mass that uh, disappeared. Uh, uh, toilet paper disappeared as well, uh, so the uh, um, insecurity has uh, come to the fore in society in these ways. How to use roads, uh, where uh, Japan is uh, learning from uh, best practice in the world. Uh, in the UK or in New York, in the United States, inclusive of what they are doing, uh, I think uh, we should. Uh, um, uh, it was very interesting to uh, uh, listen to you uh, regarding what Tokyo can do. Now we would like to uh, move to uh, the Singapore case. Uh, Dr. Hee, please. Thank you, Professor Ichikawa, for uh, inviting me to join you today. And my name is Lee Min Hee. I'm the director for the Center for Liverpool Cities, Singapore. 
Let me share my slides. So today I will be sharing with you on um, how Singapore has been able to build a healthy city which has helped us a lot in uh, dealing with the pandemic this round. So as you all know, uh, Singapore is a small city state with a very small land area of just over 720 square kilometers with one of the most dense uh, populations in the world, over 7,800 persons per square kilometers. And we believe that our success as a dense but livable city uh, has been helped by uh, these principles which we have uh, captured in the Singapore Livability Framework where the outcomes of a livable city are underpinned by integrated master planning and development as well as dynamic urban governance and we think that these are important principles for building uh, a healthy city which I will um, go on to explain. Uh, we talked a lot about density uh, in the previous few presentations and uh, this chart here shows a plot of urban population density against a city's uh, livability ranking based on Mercer's 2019 quality of living survey and you would see that Singapore is one of the few cities on the top right uh, where we are dense but yet score well uh, in livability rankings. And we believe that some of the things that we do here, which I will explain in the next few slides, has helped us in many ways to remain a livable city even as we grow denser. When we first became independent in 1965, we called ourselves a garden city, but we have gone through several iterations of being a city in a garden, a city of gardens and water. And now this year, um, the government has unveiled a new vision for us uh, about a city in nature where we live, we live in harmony with nature. So you can see here on the map on the right that we in Singapore, we have preserve four biodiversity cores in Singapore. Uh, so biodiversity is now very important in how we plan. And what we have also done is to plan our city in a biophilic way. So for example, we have implemented active, beautiful and clean waters program to uh, naturalize concrete drains to create waterways for residents to enjoy. We have built therapeutic gardens near homes so that elderly and people in wheelchair can easily access these gardens. And we have implemented programs such as LUSH, which is a landscape for urban high-rise, where uh, high-rise building developers uh, will replace the greenery lost through on the ground by sky terraces and roof gardens. We have also uh, been preparing uh, our Smart Nation framework since 2014. So we, when the pandemic struck, uh, many of us were able to transit to work from home uh, and use apps such as this Digital Workplace, which is for public servants, as well as home-based learning uh, apps, which uh, the students use for home-based home learning. Our agencies have also taken a very integrated approach to um, how they cooperate with private sector for uh, you know to use technology for us to uh, observe new social norms during the pandemic. So, for example, our Urban Redevelopment Authority has an app called Space Out, where they work with mall owners to provide real time. Uh, information for people to decide if they want to go to a mall and if it's overcrowded. Our National Parks Board has created an app called Safe, Safe Distance at Parks, which uses drone technology to provide real-time information to potential um, uh, park goers. Our town planning has also um, followed a new town structural model where we have a hierarchy of town centres and neighbourhood centres which 
very much help us to create self-sufficient new towns uh, as well as districts so that when uh, we had to work from home, a lot of amenities were near to home and easily accessed, uh, including parks. We have also been working hard to use infrastructure space for re recreation. So some of the examples are park connector networks, which are built on drainage reserves, as well as a uh, marina barrage, where the roof of a park building is used as a recreational facility. As far as our mobility goals are concerned, we have been planning for uh, so that by 2040, our longest trip uh, anywhere in Singapore would be uh, able to be fulfilled within 45 minutes to walk, cycle, ride mode using public transport or active mobility modes. And within our towns, uh, 20 minutes would be the maximum you would need to get to any facility. We have also been increasing our cycling path so that by 2030, we would have more than 1,300 kilometers of cycling paths in Singapore. Um, we have also been uh, building up our food resilience due to supply chain, uh, chain disruptions um, during the pandemic. So we have diversified our food sources. Uh, we also have a plan to build to uh, be able to grow 30% of our food needs by 2030. And we have also been helping local companies to expand overseas so that we could uh, import food uh, through these companies. Changing social behaviors uh, has been very important during the pandemic. And this is an example of a collaboration between public, private and people sectors. We have been engaging the public to uh, practice good and safe social norms. And in conjunction with private sector, as well as the community, we have launched apps such as Trace Together, which is a community contact tracing app using Bluetooth as well as safe entry, which is collaboration with private sector so that your information is captured as you enter a building. We have also been revising how we uh, plan uh, e-commerce and urban logistics so that we can make, use, uh, be make better use of resources as well as coordinating delivery schedule uh, and plan uh, for using alternative modes of delivery, such as drones. Uh, we have also been rolling out programs to, uh, to help our uh, individuals as well as businesses transit to e-platforms. So for example, 1,000 digital ambassadors have been helping seniors to transit to using digital services in their everyday lives. Uh, that's the end of my public of my uh, presentation. I hope that you would come to our website and see our research uh, from the Center for Liverpool Cities, as well as join us in the World Cities Summit 2021, where we invite mayors, business leaders, and people sector to join us in the discussion of adapting to a disruptive world. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much. For all four cities, different countermeasures have been taken, I understand. And the last presentation was from Singapore. It's a, a city that is uh, uh, introducing a lot of advanced and innovative technologies. A very insightful presentation on numerous initiatives have been shared. Miraki-san and Dr. He. Uh, gave uh, their presentation, but uh, uh, what was common, I think, was uh, we want to be watching out to what extent digitalization uh, will move forward going forward. So with the remaining time that we have, uh, well, actually, I think uh, we were able to hear very hot discussions, uh, uh, but uh, with uh, the co pandemic, the way we work, that we live, we expect that something will change. And in this context, what should we be thinking about? An Innovative City Forum 
We are thinking about the city of the future, but at the same time, global cities, major cities, and I'm not sure if compete will be a right word, but uh, cities are learning from one another uh, in uh, thinking of uh, the best way forward. And uh, today we were able to hear uh, from the major cities around the world. And since we are connected online, I want to invite discussions as to how uh, lifestyles and work styles will change going forward. And as a major global city, uh, what kind of competitiveness do you think the cities will have uh, with this as an experience? Wh what are the capabilities do you think that the cities will gain going forward? And this is uh, my first question to all of you. And those of you who are joining us online, uh, you are free to join us in the discussion uh, through the Q&A function. So in the order that you spoke, starting from London, uh, if I may pose this question, London, uh, as a major global city, how are things going to change and how is COVID-19 going to have an impact going forward? Ben, from you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think the biggest change, well, there'll be two, I think two big changes. One, I hope, will be um, a bit more uh, willing to embrace the importance of um, creating an a city which can adapt to the unexpected, um, you know, and, and a city which puts sort of resilience thinking at the heart of its planning, uh, which we hadn't really done very much in London, if I'm, if I'm honest. I'm, I'm hoping that COVID will change that that mindset and, and will prepare us as well for, um, for for climate change. I think more practically, uh, you know, I. I I think and I hope that we will see the end of a slightly sort of thoughtless automatic um, office culture, you know, where you just expected to go to work every day, uh, even when you could work from home. And that is a very, very inefficient way of doing things. It puts huge pressures on, um, on space, on the transport system. Uh, and, uh, and I completely believe that you do need face-to-face -face contact um, uh, and that is the most productive way of run, running businesses and enterprises and, and learning. But I don't think you need it in the sort of you know sustained way that we had it before. So I, and I'd like like to see a, a world where um, sort of city centres in particular sort of move up the value curve, so that they're not there just for sort of routine work and routine you know meetings. They're there for those sort of special moments where you really need to be with somebody, whether it's to see a performance or to have a meeting or because you're a young worker and you want to learn and need to learn from your from your peers and from your from your your superiors. Thank you very much for that. Being able to adapt to change, actually that is a major theme. Uh, and uh, so way of thinking it could change going forward and uh, I think we need to uh, find our way as to what can be possible. Next from New York, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I would, I guess, agree with Ben um, that um, one of the things that concerns me the most about this is, uh, is the move to uh, remote work. Um, I, I don't know that we'll see everybody continue to work from home. Um, I think it's uh, uh, easier said than done. I think there's a lot of challenges with working from home that people are, are in many ways itching to get back in the company of others. Uh, I think some people have found that uh, working uh, at home in small cramped apartments uh, is, is inconvenient after a while. Uh, I think also folks that have homes in the suburbs Sometimes the noise uh, can be uh, can be deafening and difficult, um, but I do think we are going to see more of a move towards satellite offices, um, which could have a major impact on the centers of cities. Uh, so places like Midtown in Manhattan, or as Ben was talking in his opening presentation about the center of London, um, we've already seen that in New York, and and it's had an impact. Um, you know, as fewer office workers have gone into Midtown Manhattan we've seen a, a kind of a secondary impact on all sorts of other services businesses. 
people that had gone after work for a drink uh, or people who had gone for lunch at a restaurant nearby. Uh, those kind of businesses employed a lot of people, particularly the workers without a college education. And, uh, and I'm very worried about that uh, as we move towards more of a neighborhood uh, or satellite-based office culture. Um, and I don't think it's a given, but I think that could happen. Also, I think that if we look at uh, the future of cities, the biggest threat is really is, is, is if this expands more than we even think, because what's made cities like New York and London uh, so um, fascinating but so competitive has been the proximity. You know, um, companies have moved to New York despite enormous real estate costs and high taxes, but they come because the talent is here. Um, and if the talent can be used remotely from anywhere, um, you know, I'm not sure that as many companies will, will be here or they will put as many jobs here. And I think that is a real risk for cities. Uh, last thing really quickly, what can cities like New York and others do? I feel like we have to focus on what got us here in the first place. We got to focus on the things that made New York and other cities attractive, things like culture nightlife, vibrant street life, uh, being a walkable city. You know, there's so, you know, most of the other parts of the United States don't have those things. And it's why so many people came to New York. And I think that cities like New York have got to continue to focus on those things so that even amidst all these changes, we continue to attract the talent. Thank you very much for that. You don't have to be forced to come together and you're able to ensure talent. And yet, in the meantime, uh, there was a beauty in people coming together. Uh, and so both of those uh, were, uh, were are needed going forward, I think. And it was uh, that was a story from New York that was quite uh, convincing. And next, uh, Muraki-san, please. Uh, not only in Tokyo, but uh, if you could share with us uh, what you think of uh, the situation in Japan in the future. Thank you for asking me the question. Basically, I am exactly in agreement with the other two just mentioned. What is needed of a global city is culture, transportation, environment, vibrancy, and entertainment. These things are critical to a global city. And with COVID-19, there are additional things that we need to think about, which is flexibility, in my view. Flexibility is about where you work, about the workplace, and the workplace, depending on the industry that you're working in, uh, it's quite diverse. So going forward, what are the types of businesses will be suitable for working from home or you don't have to be too mindful of where you live. I think we need to be thinking of those things going forward. But having said that, no matter what industry you're in, face-to-face -face communication is very important. That's something that we came to realize with COVID-19. And those will stay in major cities in order to realize that. Digital or information. To what extent we are able to ensure that, that there's a, a, a equal uh, access to, to information? That's also something very important going forward. Thank you very much for that. Listening to, to you in this discussion, London, New York, Tokyo, we're all facing a sim similar situation. Uh, from Singapore, uh, Dr. Lim Min Hee. Hey, thank you. Um, I'd like to elaborate on three points uh, to answer your question. I think, first of all, uh, we need to see new forms of collaboration between the public, private and people sector, or in other words, to take a whole of society approach because many of the solutions that we need to for us to overcome the pandemic and to live with um, the virus, because I don't think it will ever go away, really, is that we need to take an integra uh, integrated approach and that uh, a lot of a lot more co collaboration has to take place between these sectors. Number two, about leveraging on technology. As you can see from the Singapore example, uh, we had built up our digital infrastructure to allow 
us to work from home as well as to do home-based learning. And this is very important uh, to be able to adapt and to leverage on the most advanced technology to help us. And even in the nature of our work, we have been able to switch from lectures to webinars and having meetings through Zoom uh, and do you know collaborative workshop through uh, internet platforms. So that's uh, what we have to do. And number three, really we have to build healthy cities. Uh, I think uh, we elaborated on that earlier uh, through the other speakers. We need to make our cities very green, full of parks that people can go to easily from their homes make active mobility and car-like society a part of everyday life so that we can have a choice of walking and cycling uh, to nearby destinations and to work in a you know location close to home uh, in the future city. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Attractiveness of uh, major cities needs to be maintained and yet at the same time for people to live and work that uh, may change going forward by leveraging diverse technologies that could be changed. And at the end of the day, uh, what we need to think about is green. Uh, this is not only for major cities, but it's for the whole country when we plan um, uh, we need green. Green is so important. And with COVID-19, the pandemic, we came to realize how important green is. So I think that uh, all cities have a lot of commonalities. But I have one interesting piece of information to share with you. Tokyo uh, is very concentrated. It is a very centralized city. So uh, as a result, uh, pe we have been saying that uh, more people may be flowing out of Tokyo, which is too congested. But uh, as I mentioned at the onset, about 70% of Tokyo people want to stay, but uh, a bit less than 30% are considering relocating. And uh, the situation is a bit different from New York. And uh, Singapore and London is probably somewhere between New York and Tokyo. But when we see the latest data in November, So uh, when we looked at the populational uh, change uh, between June to August or June to September, in Tokyo there are 23 wards, 23 uh, small uh, regions. 15 out of 23 uh, showed a decline in population, which means in eight there was an increase in population. And all these eight are really city centers. However, uh, for Minato and the Shinjuku world, there was a decline in population. Uh, the reason being that uh, many uh, non-Japanese people live in these wars. So uh, because they left to go back to their own country, there was a decline in population. But uh, amongst the uh, 23 wars, the uh, wars that increased population was really at the center of the city, center of Tokyo. And we saw uh, for uh, New York and Singapore that uh, people want to relocate to even center of the city. So this is very interesting. So uh, what is the fascination of these uh, large cities? Uh, this remains unchanged. And this is very strong pull. Of course, uh, some people are, are very afraid of the pandemic and don't want to live in a congested area. At the same time, uh, people uh, are still uh, looking for uh, the appeal of the cities. So uh, in that sense, as you said, uh, sustainability may be uh, one of the challenge uh, for uh, uh, global cities going forward. So maybe uh, large cities uh, will be able to uh, continue to prosper. Or if large cities were to lose their appeal and we see a decline in large cities, this will have a very big impact on the country and the world. So there are, I think, optimistic views and pessimistic views. So you are experts. So you are saying that uh, there is always a way to continue to make these cities prosper. But uh, what would be a pessimistic scenario? Oh, 
perhaps briefly, do you think that it is possible to see a catastrophic scenario where the cities really collapse? Uh, let me start from uh, Singapore, uh, from Dr. He. If this pandemic becomes even worse and uh, the, the virus mutates, do you think that there is a possibility that large cities will collapse? I think that uh, cities that have prepared themselves by being, uh, you know, by building up resilience, not just in infrastructure, but community resilience, which I think something that the Japanese are very good at. I don't think we will see a collapse of cities, but I think that cities uh, will uh, have to change and, and be more resilient for the future. So this, this is not just about pandemics, but also being uh, building ourselves to be resilient to climate change, food shortages, uh, economic change, and so on. So I think, first of all, uh, the idea of building resilient cities is a very important one. And one of the ways that we have done this, uh, not, not just now, but already uh, quite some time back is to build polycentric cities in Singapore. So we no longer just depend on a CBD, but have many regional centers uh, where we have built them up as innovation districts, uh, which are near homes. And uh, increasingly, we are also building more and more uh, self-sufficient new towns and districts so that uh, it's not necessary for everyone to go to the city to work, but they are able to find jobs near their homes and be able to achieve their everyday needs uh, within their districts or neighbourhoods. So that is my answer to your question. Thank you very much. Let me pose the same question to uh, New York, which has experienced a very difficult situation early on. Uh, you're still able to control the pandemic now, but uh, do you have any concerns about the future of New York, Jonathan? Of course, um, I, have, I have concerns about the future of New York. Um, I, I don't think we're going to see a collapse. Um, and, you know, New York has bounced back, has been very resilient, obviously, from the 9 11 uh, terrorist attacks, uh, but also there was a major fiscal crisis in the 1970s. Um, also, I think that the specific question about will a pandemic and fears about the continued spread cause New York uh, or other cities, but New York especially, to lose population. Um, and, and I think the way that New York has bounced back since April or May, and, and it's really shown that it's one of the safest places in the United States in this pandemic. And I think for that reason, you know, there's nowhere else that people are going to want to go to feel safer. And, and, and I think that's one reason that, that the city will bounce back. And frankly, I think that's one thing that New York's going to have to do going forward. Um, I think one of the most important things to bounce back and to be resilient is to get even, even safer. Um, you know, New York bounced back from the crime wave that we saw in the 1980s and early 90s with, by becoming safe, by really investing in public safety. New York um, did well after 9-11 by, by making sure the city really knew what it was doing in combating terrorism. It became one of the leading cities globally in becoming safe from terrorism. That was, con that was very uh, uh, critical uh, to convince residents, to convince other folks around the world to keep coming to New York. And I think right now in this pandemic, New York needs to make sure it takes the steps to become extremely safe in a health crisis like this or something similar. And I don't think we've done it yet. I think that, you know, other cities in Asia especially have shown that they learned from the SARS crisis several years ago, and they did much better this time. New York, I think, has got to show the world that it is safer than ever and that it has learned from the problems we had in April. Uh, I think we've done some of that, but there's a long way to go. Thank you very much. And for London, uh, Ben, you said that uh, London is a city that is able to cope with change and that uh, it has flexibility. But 
do you envision a, a tragic development uh, for your city in the future? Well, I, I, I hope not, and not just for London's sake, but for, for the sake of the rest of the country as well, because London, you know, like New York and like Tokyo, plays such an important role in the national economy. Um, it would be disastrous for, 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 for Britain's economy if London was to, um, to fall off its pedestal as one of the world's um, leading global capitals. Yeah, but I mean, I, I look at this pandemic as just one of the sort of you know, risks, I mean, that cities face. I mean, cities have, you know, the great thing about cities is they bring people close together uh, and that's why they're productive and, and creative. Um, but, but that proximity brings all sorts of risks and challenges, you know, congestion, contagion, overcrowding, fire. These have always been, been, been with us. It, it's not very different. I mean, if I, if I sort of have, uh, I say, a worry, particularly about London, it's that we're going to focus so much on um, preparing ourselves for the next pandemic that it will distract attention from some of the even bigger challenges. And I'm thinking here, particularly sort of climate change. So, I mean, on the, you know, when I'm feeling optimistic, what I think is this, this is great. This has alerted the world to, and particularly London, to sort of, you know, major threats and the unexpected. And we'll have to put resilience um, at the center of our thinking in the way that we weren't before. Uh, and we'll have to think long-term. When I'm feeling pessimistic, I feel that this is just gonna sort of uh, clued our attention to other other issues, and particularly climate change. And actually, I've seen civil servants and governments in action, and they can only do one or two things at a time really well. And and um, yeah, we'll 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 create a, a cities which are resilient to, to, to pandemics, but at the cost of, of of less resilience, perhaps to other things. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I have a question for Miki San. Um, I'm living in Tokyo. There is too much centralization, so there is a significant risk. Uh, was uh, one prevailing view? Well, there was some uncertainty in living in a big city like uh, Tokyo. I think uh, centralization uh, is is uh, not the issue uh, because of uh, the uh, conglomeration. Uh, there is a, a city is working uh, and uh, fulfilling its functions. Miki-san, you're living in Tokyo. What is your view on this? I agree with you. Uh, Tokyo uh, is uh, the driving force uh, of the Japanese economy, and uh, that is expected uh, by everyone. So I don't think uh, Tokyo will ever uh, collapse. Uh, that will not occur, uh, because uh, any city uh, collapsing will mean a significant impact uh, on the global economy. So I don't think that uh, will occur. Now, I was looking at uh, Jonathan's uh, 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 charts, and I thought uh, that uh, in Japan, we are said to have been facing the third wave. Uh, but uh, there is a better uh, opportunity to utilize external um, space. And I think uh, this will further enhance the attractiveness of uh, Tokyo. So we should think very hard about this, uh, inclusive of uh, the post-corona world. Well, we are running out of time now, and uh, we'd like to discuss uh, what do, uh, can you do uh, to enhance your city's attractiveness? Uh, what are the key words uh, to represent this? Uh, what uh, is the relevant uh, key words? It could be several or one word uh, to uh, describe uh, your city going forward. Uh, I know that you've mentioned this, but uh, we just want to reconfirm. Uh, so let's start uh, with Ben Sun from London. What is the key word for London going forward? Um, I'm trying to think of something which is not obvious. I mean, I'm thinking obviously of you know, <laughs> growth, <laughs> green, green growth, healthy, healthy, healthy growth. I, mean, I think in London, you know, in London, we have gone for a sort of quite a crude model of growth. You know, it, it's been very much focused on the center um, and uh, all the development that we've been doing, I think, is is been good or, or, or resilient. Um, so I think I think I hope I hope that we'll continue to sort of grow. I hope we'll continue to be a, a leading global city. 
but I hope, think we'll do it in a way which is more resilient and more, more sustainable and, and more inclusive. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for that explanation. It's very clear. So, um, does anyone want to go uh, ahead of others uh, for the remaining three? Or let's go in a different order. Uh, what is the key word uh, for Singapore? For me, I, I have three key words. One oh, is resi oh, yeah. resilience, research, and recentering. So, as I said, we need to make our cities a lot more resilient. Uh, we need to focus on research. Uh, and accumulate knowledge as well as share knowledge about how to be more resilient cities uh, and the cooperation of cities through forums like the World City Summit is very important. And lastly, the third R is about recentering on the human being. So we have to make cities uh, that are healthy and green and car light. So I hope uh, that and encapsulates my views well. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, New York, what is the key word for you? I have two. The first is preparation. I think that I think cities have to prepare to be resilient. I think to, to prepare to deal with the uncertainties of the 21st century that's not only a health crisis like a pandemic, but also uh, climate change, uh, terrorism. Uh, and so many other things that I think the world is throwing at us these days, cities have got to be prepared. Then the second one is inclusive. Um, we didn't talk about it too much today. I know Ben mentioned it a little bit, but New York has always gotten so much strength from its diversity. A lot of cities do. Uh, but I think in recent years, we've seen that so, that so many New Yorkers, particularly people of color in the city of New York, have struggled to get ahead. Um, and, and I think that if we don't figure this out and help more New Yorkers prosper or have the access and opportunity to do so, then I think this, the city of New York will be uh, a less important place. Thank you very much. Same question for Miki-san. Thank you very much. Well, this is very difficult to answer. Uh, in order to make uh, decisions, uh, we need data. And how do we present data? Uh, that is also very important. Uh, furthermore, flexibility uh, is also very important. Last point uh, is how to evaluate uh, this. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. So what's common to the four speakers uh, is that uh, um, you are confident about your city, so what you need is to uh, continue to operate the cities uh, with uh, resilience. And listening to everyone, uh, what I was impressed the most uh, is that uh, there were similar uh, common points, and uh, the issues uh, are increasingly uh, becoming uh, more important. Uh, uh, San, uh, the World City Summit, uh, I wanted to go actually for 2020, um, but uh, the planes were not uh, operating, so I'm looking forward to next year. We are uh, global cities, uh, we are rivals, but uh, we, it uh, also makes sense uh, to share information uh, for uh, the world, uh, for humankind. I believe that uh, we have a very important role to play. Uh, so very late at night, very early in the morning from New York and London. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, let me say you're in a similar time zone. Uh, but uh, against the backdrop uh, of uh, COVID-19, uh, this is the first virtual meeting we are holding today. Uh, but uh, social cities uh, will uh, be, uh, last forever. And uh, I think that's a good conclusion from this discussion. Thank you.